We noted this morning that there is a proper way to think, and there is also a dangerous way to think, as we'll see this evening. We saw that today that the book of God is presented to us for us to read, and every time we read, we're thinking. We may not realize it, but we are. And we've got to make sure that we properly think. And we saw this morning where we are to be thinking in terms of God first and realize that sometimes people are not thinking from God's first. They're thinking about themselves. In Proverbs, the 23rd chapter and verse 7, we have a familiar passage as a man thinketh within himself, so is he. It's in a context of verse 6 where he says that indeed don't eat, don't drink with someone that has an evil eye, an evil eye. Don't, don't kind of want his dainties that he might show. It may be tempting, but don't do that. For why? For as a man thinketh within himself. So is he, that's why. And he'll ask thee, he wants you to eat and drink with him, but his heart is not with you. His heart's not with you. He's thinking differently than you do. I can't think of a time when you would get ambushed with someone that's thinking like you do, maybe wants to harm you, that would invite you out to lunch. When we eat together, there's a sense of relaxation. We're indeed with friends. We don't think anything's going to bad happen, but sometimes, as we see here, that could be the thing that throws us off guard. We think, well, we care for one another. And you may be someone that's following the things of love. Paul says, love believeth all things. You wouldn't think somebody would be inviting you out to eat in order to destroy you, but it can happen. It happens in Proverbs. You've got to be weary. So we want to not think bad about others. We don't want to impugn people's motives, but we're on guard that because people don't think properly, their, their heart is not with you. Their thinking is not with you. They would like to destroy you, maybe, that you need to be aware of that. So we need to be aware of thinking that's dangerous. It could be dangerous for someone that doesn't have the right thinking upon us, or we can have a dangerous thought that can lead us further and further away from God. And one of those we saw this morning in 1 Corinthians, the, the eighth chapter, where he says, knowledge puffeth up. So I have knowledge. I reason. What happens when you think, you gain knowledge. You have a reasoning for things. And you reason from certain things that you know. So knowledge can puff up. And all of a sudden we see the bad part of thinking is sometimes it can come from a heart that's full of pride. The boastful heart. The heart's full of pride is the wrong type of thinking. And it can lead us astray. One of the great examples of such thinking is Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel, the fourth chapter. He had, saw, he had a, a, a dream of a great big tree. Oh, and it was a wonderful tree. It had branches on it, and it was indeed great. But what happens is some of the angels come down, and they cut down that tree, but they leave the roots. They leave the, the stump with its roots. And they'll put iron around it to protect it. But Daniel was to interpret that dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And he knew that it's only, what it says, it'd be only for your adversaries, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel didn't really want to tell him, but indeed he does. And what we begin to see is that he wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know that God rules in the kingdom of men. And Nebuchadnezzar was feeling pretty proud of himself. You'll notice that in verse 30, the king spake, as he is running, walking around in his palace of Babylon. He says that the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built for the royal dwelling place by the might of my power for the glory of my majesty? Rhetorical question. He's, I guess he's talking to himself. You know, the answer was surely 
this is great Babylon that I have built. It's my raw dwelling place. It's for my majesty. It's all about me. And when he uttered such things as this, God brings forth the judgment of that vision he saw. And when we see what happened in verse 23, that he would hew down the tree and destroy it. Nevertheless, he would leave a stump of the roots. He said, even a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beast of the field. And that's exactly what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He's grass like an oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. We see in verse 33. His hair was grown like eagle's feathers. And his nails like bird's claws. That came true. And it was immediately after he was boasting of his great power. God rules in the kingdom of men. And he is going to humble Nebuchadnezzar. Now what's interesting in verse 34. At the end of these days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes. Where? Unto heaven. And my understanding returned unto me. My reasoning returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom from generation to generation. And if you'll notice in verse 37. His ways are not only the ways of justice. And those that walk in pride he's able to abase. Those who walk in pride, he's able to humble and bring down. God is able to do that. He rules in the kingdom of men, even in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. He rules. Pride is the wrong type of thinking. It leads our faults to thinking we're greater than God. But notice, every time we start with God, we'll think rightly. He looked up into heaven and his reasoning came back to him. He's not just a beast. He's not a beast. He's a man. And he realized that his glory was given to him because of God. And there he was humbled and praised the most, the most high. Pride is a difficult thing that is something that hurts us. It's, it's the wrong type of thinking that happens a lot of times. In 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, there was a soldier, the Syrian army. He was indeed a leper. And the Bible speaks about him and his dealing with leprosy that he received. And he was, he was going to be meeting up with, with the prophet Elisha. And in verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Nahum's thinking wrongly. Nahum was raw and went away and behold I thought he said I thought he will surely come out to me first of all they would call upon the name of Jehovah wave his hand and heal the leper if that's what he thought his heart's full of pride isn't it he had a messenger come to me I thought he would come to see me and he would do this marvelous thing out of it. He had it all worked out of the way it ought to be. Go wash in the river Jordan seven times. It wasn't hard to understand. But he thought. His pride was getting in the way of him obeying the command. He was mad. He had a friend tell him, you ought to do that. And finally he does that. And when he dipped seven times, he was healed. That type of thinking gets in the way of our healing. Have you ever heard anybody say, I don't understand why we have to be baptized? Well, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized should be saved. Peter, on the first day of, of the Pentecost, after his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, he preached the gospel to them. And that gospel saves, but they had to respond. They had to receive that gospel. And that was to <laughs> repent and be baptized. Every one of you. Didn't leave anybody out. Peter says that baptism doth now save us. It's not taking a bath, it's washing away the flesh, but it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. And we see all those passages just as clear as, 
dip seven times in Jordan River, it is the idea of be baptized for the remission of your sins. It saves us. But we think differently. So we're not interested in being baptized. That's bad thinking. That's dangerous thinking, isn't it? Thinking is indispensable. You've got to think if you're ever going to be saved. But it's also dangerous because pride gets in the way. This last week, there's been a famous evangelist who is on the Internet a lot. I've listened to him preach. He's a skillful preacher. But he was fired from his lofty perch where he was preaching. And one of the things he preaches his last sermon, before, and he, he's being fired, don't hold one mistake to define the man. Don't let one hiccup in your life define the man. And I think that's being fair, David. Man after God's own heart was one indeed that he had an affair. He tried to hide it. He killed the man in order to hide it. Did horrible things. But you let one thing destroy the good that David did. He was preaching that. That was his, going to be his last sermon to the people. And the elders of that church, the leaders of that church, had to send out that he had an affair with a woman. He's no longer preaching here. He's no longer being supported here. And it wasn't long after that that all of his connections where he would hold seminars across this country. He'd hold many teaching things. People looked at him as an expositor of the Bible. And they would listen to his podcast. They listen every Thursday morning to hear him teach a lesson on how to preach. This one event has happened to him. And you would never think that would be the case, but it happens. He's not the first man fallen like that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, He that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. I don't care who we are. We can be put in situations where we don't think well. In fact, it can be very harmful. I was told this evening, and I think it applies here, it's wise saying, sometimes we don't think about what we're thinking about. If he'd have known all the situations, his wife didn't know yet. All the situations that have, he wasn't thinking what he's thinking about. And that affair with that woman. Men who honored him are on the podcast almost in tears, thinking, how could that have happened? How could it have happened? Pride. And you wonder, it's fresh, it's new, it's something that's happened this week. They're hoping that they'll bring him to repentance. Could he be resisting that in his pride? I don't know. But the lesson learned, he's not the first one, won't be the last. We need to think about what we're thinking about. And realize, what are the consequences of that? Start with God instead of our evil desires and try to say we'll, we'll, over, we'll get by with that. Some pride that is. So pride is, the, is kind of the main one when we think about thinking that is dangerous and it's not good. But pride leads to something else. Sometimes it leads to jealousy. It leads to jealousy. And we see that in the Bible, a number of examples of that. But I want to I want to Look at Saul and David's relationship that they had together. And we find in 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter, where David is going to be married. And the lady, he, he was going to be given, Saul was going to give him to another daughter. But Melchah is one that is indeed he's going to have. And she, she loved him dearly. And Saul realized that here was an opportunity for 
him to give his daughter away that will cause David to fall. And that's his thinking process. It's not good. It's not the right type of thinking. But it, it came from jealousy. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter and verse 7. The women were singing as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth. This saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they've ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? That's, that's his thoughts. What can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Not good thoughts for him. And he has the opportunity to give a daughter to him to marry. And so it came to pass at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adreo and Ahalathite to, uh, to wife. And Michael, Saul's daughter, verse 20, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And he said, I will give him to her, and she may be a snare to him. That's what he's thinking about. Giving my daughter to him? She'll be a snare to him. And that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Now, how would you like to give your daughter to marriage and have that kind of attitude? Beware, groom. <laughs> Beware. Some people aren't thinking good, not thinking well, as, as they should do. So what? He said, I don't want a dowry, David. I want a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Well, why would he say that? Because in verse 25, the king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. Saul fought. There's your thinking. Saul fought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. We'll put him in harm's way. And because he eyes him, because David gets more praise than he gets, kill thousands, but David ten thousands. It's, it's affected how he gives his daughter away. His plan in order to put him in harm's way, give, give, I, I want a hundred. He got two hundred from David. David just complies, okay, when I killed two hundred of them. And brought those four skins there, and we realize how wroth and how angry he was. That's jealousy. Oh, you didn't kill ten thousands of people. And David, it just makes him mad or matter. And he begins to affect his relationship with Jonathan, as Jonathan was very close to David, throws a spear at him, trying to destroy someone that all it is is a jealousy that he has toward David. He'll take my kingdom. There's pride there, but pride leads to jealousy sometimes. I think of myself greater, but he seems to be better, and therefore we get jealous. And we want to bring people down instead of striving to build people up as we saw this morning. That's the right type of thinking. How to edify. And when we edify out of love, God knows us. We're thinking first with God. But these men are not thinking that way. And therefore there's the, the jealousy that comes upon them. That they're going to have to, have, have, to, have to deal with. And that becomes indeed a problem. Sometimes... People sin, and they feel, feel, the, they feel the guilt of sin, and that indeed comes upon them. And really, we have a conscience, we think, and it ought to be that way. We ought to feel the guilt of sin. And we work through this area, well, you, you don't need to be destroyed by your sin. Well, here's a man we talked about a while ago, he's sinned, and his life looks like it's destroyed at this moment. He didn't think through all of those things. And we begin to realize that here was indeed something that he should have thought about. And we see our sin and we think there's no way God could ever forgive me. Let me give you an example of that that happens a lot. We read of some, okay, that's abortion. Women who have abortions. Sometimes they want to keep it quiet. 
When they were young, they had an abortion. Maybe their parents didn't want to deal with it and their parents suggested get an abortion, they get an abortion, but they have to live with that. And they feel the guilt of that. And they feel like there is no way that God could ever forgive me. And yet we see Paul say, I'm the chiefest of sinners in 2 Timothy. He killed Christians. He murdered people. But he was able to come out of the guilt of sin, he was able to come and rem remember those things that he would never forget. Of all the Christians he killed, he could remember, that's what I am, that's what I was. But he didn't have to wear the guilt any longer. Because he was forgiven. And that's the way it ought to be. We feel the guilt, but we're able to put our faith and trust in God and think straightly, realize that he's on our side. He wants us to be forgiven. But sometimes people don't want to go there. And so sometimes people just don't look at the sin that they've committed. They don't want to be destroyed. I was just kind of sowing my wild oats. And that's just the way it was back then. And we just covered that up. But mothers that killed the baby in the womb what abortion is taking a human being's life that's innocent and it's hard to live with themselves in fact they can't and it's difficult how can they get out of that rut how can you feel the pain of sin live in the consequences of your sin realize I'm no good why did I do that in this particular example, to me, they, she's having twins. And it was suggested to get an abortion. And she did it. And she said, how could God ever forgive me? Well, you could take her to, 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 to Paul, and he's the chiefest of sinners. But it's something that here is a mother. And that's what, indeed, she was. How can someone feel that weight and still let it go when they're forgiven. And I think the book of Micah has a great example of that. Micah spoke about the fact, let my enemies, don't let my enemies, look down upon me, I have borne the indignation of Jehovah. I've borne the indignation of Jehovah. There's the pain of their sin. But don't let the enemies there because he knows that God is with him that he will see the light of Jehovah and he comes out of that and that he will indeed be restored. There's one having faith in the promises of God. That's thinking <laughs> properly. And having promises of God that says, I will forgive you, forgive you all your iniquities. We must realize I feel the pain. It's not wrong to feel that pain. I'm no good at all. Go through all of that. But knowing that you're going to have the light and you're going to be redeemed from that place and enjoy the place with him forevermore. So don't gloat over me, my enemies. I'm not destroyed. That's not the end of me. And people can make bad decisions. But when they start thinking in terms that God hasn't forgiven, that destroys their, their faith and confidence in God. And for his forgiveness. I'll forgive you of all your iniquities that you've committed. <laughs> Killing, murder can be forgiven. But it's that we feel so guilty and we feel so bad and it's so strong upon us. The indignation of God's wrath we just stay melted under. And God doesn't want that. He wants us to feel that pain. But at the same time realizing He's the one that's going to bring us out of that, that pit. And that becomes the very thing that becomes important to us. And I think that's the type of thinking that we ought to have. Pride can destroy us. Jealousy can be involved in destroying us. We can have the pride that we'll never fall. We'll never fall, but we, we can. And that's why when we try to bring people to Christ and, and bring people back to restore our, our fellow Christians, brothers, when we do that, we're to look to ourselves, lest we also be tempted. 
We have warnings about that. And when I read that, I better be thinking. I better be thinking soberly. I can be in that situation. That might make me more tender and kind toward the person I'm restoring. But also realize that I'm going to feel the brunt of that pain of sin. And he wants us to. But he's going to lift us out. And to realize I don't have to destroy myself because I failed one time. I may have done something so horrible that I don't see how anybody could forgive me. And God can. And I think that's a, a great thing to end on when we think about the bad types of thoughts that we have. That's our, they're dangerous. We have to think or we can't be saved. We can't go to heaven without, first of all, thinking. But we need to think straight with God first, then be involved in thinking that edifies others instead of destroying them. And realize that here are these pitfalls out here. Pride is the big one. Leads to jealousy. It leads to our self-confidence. The pride does. That we'll never fall. We don't think through the consequences of our sins when we're confronted with that. We need to think through those things. And to realize that when we do fall, there's not anything that we can do that, first of all, we'll feel the brunt of it. Godly sorrow works repentance. And that sorrow can be very heavy because we see how horrible we've done. Abortion is one of those. And we need to realize we, need, we can move on. We can be forgiven. So how are you thinking today? How are you thinking this evening about yourselves? And realize that they, I need to pay attention. My thoughts were going to be set forth open to God in the judgment. I need to think properly. What is trust? What is, what is pure and, and true? And that which is we saw this morning. And that's how we live our lives. We think through the scriptures. Every time we read it, that's a good process to go through. You'll have good thoughts that help establish us. And then avoid the pitfalls. And we will be thinking in a proper way. This evening, if you're not a child of God, what think ye about being baptized? If that's the event that you have. You say, well, I've, I've been baptized when I was a baby. Well... We thank with God that that's not what the Bible teaches us. Baptism was for people who, first of all, could believe. They need to repent of their sins. How bad it is, I'm going to turn from that and realize God can forgive me. He's wanting to forgive. He'll forgive us all unrighteousness. And realize that on my repentance and confession of who Jesus is, I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins. Little babies don't have sin, but we do. And you may have never obeyed that gospel. We encourage you to do that. Remember, dipping seven times in the River Jordan wasn't the way that that man thought it ought to be. And being baptized for mission of your sins, you may not think that's the way it ought to be. You need to think again. Because that's exactly what God commands us to do. If we can assist you in any way, come as we stand and as we sing.